Okay, guys, we are back, but Sunita is still not being able to log on. So, let me first start with Sunari at least, because we have almost 200 people waiting for us, and those others on Facebook Live too. So, uh, Vishu, I'm going to introduce Sonali first now. We'll just change that pattern. So, and anyway, I have this great opportunity. I seem to draw the short straw every time. I'm supposed to introduce people who need no introduction. So let me try the difficult bit again. Sonali Rastogi, she's an internationally renowned architect and the founder partner of uh, Morphogenesis, one of the largest architectural firms in India and listed amongst the top 100 architectural firms globally. She is a leading speaker on housing and urbanism, having lectured at numerous reputed universities and conferences worldwide. Working across a diverse canvas ranging from architecture to urban design, landscape and interior design, Sonali is passionately interested in the materiality and craft in architecture and is deeply invested in the detail of building. A fellow of the Royal in the Indian Institute of Architects, the Royal Society of Arts UK, and a chartered member of the Royal Institute of British Architects. She also extends her impact on the built environment as a council member of the PUAC, the Delhi Urban Arts Commission. A winner of over 100 prestigious awards, her works have been featured in over 850 publications, both national and international. You're all seeing her PPT being run on the screen and tells you that caliber of the work she and her husband Manit have done over the years. Also one of the oldest members of IIID Delhi. So thank you Sonali, you've been part of almost every big event we've done. And now the webinar is the next big thing. So thank you for joining us all. <coughs> okay, so let me officially introduce once again a lady who needs no introduction, Sunita Poli. No, no. Globally recognized. Uh, Rishu, can you run the PPT and along with it so that not that people need to know, but still it'll be good. So Sunita is a globally recognized national award-winning interior designer, furniture manufacturer, and architectural restorer since 1971. Her professional portfolio includes several significant public and heritage buildings, hotels, houseboats, sports, palaces, libraries, museums, and select residences in India, Egypt, Pakistan, Bhutan, England, and Sri Lanka. She is the president of K2 India, an award-winning architectural and design firm, whose CEO is her daughter, Koelika Kohli, who we also saw on screen just now trying to set up the video. Sunita is the former chairperson of uh, the School of Planning and Architecture, SPA Bhopal, where she championed the first conference in South Asian vernacular architecture. She has lectured and presented papers in several universities in the UK, the US, Southeast Asia, and earlier for the Millennium Book on, on New Delhi by the Oxford University Press, she wrote an extended essay on the planning of New Delhi and Sir Edward Lutyens, and is considered the India expert on Lutyens' work in New Delhi. Currently, she has four books under preparation and publication, and she has recently co-authored the Lucknow Cookbook with her mother, Chand Sur, who is a legendary cook. The Lucknow cookbook has been launched in almost every premier literary festival in India. And its most recent launch was in Singapore at the Festival of Indian Arts and Ideas. In September 2019, Sunita was the chief curator of the Times of India first design <coughs> event, I believe it was called TOIDX, which was a two-day festival of art, craft and architecture and design et etymologies. She is the editor of Kala, an anthology of essays on contemporary design aesthetics, which was first launched in Dubai. And of course, in 1992, years ago, Sunita was conferred with the Padma Shri for contribution to national life in the field of interior design and architectural restoration by the President of India in New Delhi. The same year, she was presented the Mahila Shiromani Award by Mother Teresa, of course, now St. Teresa, in Kolkata. And most recently, in October 2019, Sunita was present with the prestigious Hall of Fame Award. And ever since the Architectural Digest A plus D, 50 awards has been constituted. K2 India has figured on every award list of Architectural Digest India. So that is the, and that believe me is the short introduction for Sunita Kohli. The long one went into four pages, so I've chosen not to read it. 
And thank also, you. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you, Sunita and Sonali. It's been a real pleasure having both of you. And I would like to start you. with you, Sunita, the first question, since we lost a little bit of time. So from the 1970s, you have designed a wide range of products, projects, and you have been the only such designer in the field, man or woman. How do you manage to handle this wide range of projects? Uh, mine is always, mine, mine was an unplanned uh, profession and very much like, uh, and I'm not, I've never studied design. So I want to state that very clearly, very quickly. And uh, particularly in the context of today, where there is a notification that you don't have to study architecture to be an architect. I have to say, I do not quite agree with that because times have moved on, times have changed. And it cannot be like my time because I was such a strongly motivated autodidact that it was possible for me to research, to do it. And uh, well, uh, speaking of Lachins is Delhi, where I've done extensive work, he, he not only did not study architecture, but he never even went to school. So how did I manage all this? Well, the first project came in the mid 70s, uh, which was a hotel for the Oberoi's in Khajura, where I really learned on the shop floor. And then in our profession, you are only as good as your last project. That was very well accepted. Then it went on to other hotels, Hobaneshwar, etc. Then work in Egypt, in Kuwait, in uh, in um, uh, in Iraq, and that's a hotel boat on the Nile that I did out of two hundred odd hotel boats. That won the best first prize, and it was very different to every other hotel boat that was. <clears throat> cruising on the Nile and of course you know then when you see uh, pictures like this this image we worked with by hand on blueprints everything was done with pen <clears throat> the world has changed today because of AutoCAD and everything that you can do on the computer ours was a very hand done uh, era so therein lies the difference between when I started and when what happened uh, now and so you see the built reality from what was just a cross section. And uh, of course, you know, working with, I was very, uh, I was very fortunate that from the late 70s, I was working with major <coughs> international companies, uh, people like who designed, I mean, Swemab, the company that designed this uh, boat is Swedish. And this is a boat that we conceived together right from the beginning. So it was totally different to any other uh, luxury uh, cruiser on the Nile because it did not have small portholes, but these uh, ceiling to floor windows. So you could be on your balcony and you could cruise looking at the Nile on either side. So there were several firsts like that that one uh, was responsible for. And, um, and then uh, this is uh, Bhubaneswar. Uh, uh, this is, sorry, I beg your pardon, Bhutan. It's the parliament building that I had done, which I was responsible for the exteriors, the interiors, and which is totally, uh, it was totally conceived with their own design traditions. And it's used state of the art, uh, 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 you know, translating facilities, lighting, etc. But the entire building can only be in Bhutan. And that's the way I like to work because, you know, uh, Bhutan would not be the same if you tried to do a Manhattan uh, place, something which was sensible for Manhattan. I mean, every, and this is, uh, that was in 1990 and this is in 2010 for the SARC, um, uh, for the SARC conference that uh, both Kohelika and I were brought back to uh, redesign many, many areas. This is the VVIP lounge. Uh, so I, I think I've been able to work on several projects together because I am not a multitasker. Uh, I have to admit, I like to concentrate on one project. I might be working on 10 projects simultaneously. But my research is totally concentrated when I'm working for those couple of hours on that particular project. I'm cut off from everything else. 
And that's the way I've always done it. I mean, here's a Hyderabad house, which I totally restored from, from the attic uh, to the ground floor uh, or in nine months, which was, and it was completely closed for this. And when I'm saying restoration, it means looking at all the services, all the stone, and last of all came the furniture, the interiors, the artifacts. This courtyard is because there was no courtyard. So in the style of Lachians, one put in this courtyard after having studied how he had handled courtyards. So that in two years time, I mean, the best uh, conservation work is where in two years time, nobody even knows that there was the intervention of an architect and uh, or a designer. That to me is a successful conservation project. It's different when one is designing hotels because then you're doing this. Uh, this is Rashupati Bhavan. Again, over five years, I had completely restored it from outside, inside, all th 360 rooms and lodges. I do not know what, uh, what uh, I have not been inside for a while. The last, my last working there was, I haven't worked continuously, but in phases, but this was when I, when one had done, it's a stock picture, but when one had worked five years on it and we had looked at every single detail, there was a committee that had been set up with uh, by government, which included the late uh, architect Charles Correa and the late landscape architect, Professor Shaheed. And out of that, I was selected. Somebody actually has to do the drawings and has to physically do the work. But it, it was always with joint consultations. And um, uh, here, of course, when whilst doing this, uh, what one tried to do is to uh, Indianize it to the extent that every fabric that was used, firstly, was woven by master craftsmen and only handwoven fabric was used, not using any mill-made fabric. Every artifact that was placed that was brought in new had all been done by master craftsmen who had won the President's Award. So this was a statement that one was trying to make in a building like Rashtrapati Bhavan. And this is, that was uh, 1986. This was uh, set up the panel drawing room for uh, when Mr. Obama came here. And I've always tried to use whatever is in the house, wherever it is, whether it's the old Matsuli uh, Patnam carpets, getting them clean, as much of the furniture, only the sofas one had done 20 years before and they were reupholstered again in handwoven fabric. Uh, this is South Block, which I have extensively restored. I mean, the PMO, which I had restored completely, including including the courtyard, which had concrete structures in it, that those were removed. And I'm happy, happy to say, because it was done for the Prime Minister of India, not for any individual, that the PMO, from what I can make out from pictures, I haven't gone, it remains the same throughout. And I and uh, this this central, this spot for share that you see is really the entrance to, uh, to the Ministry of External Affairs, which I also did. And the, the extreme... Uh, left is um, is the Ministry of Defence, which I also had done. I purposely brought this in because I knew I'd be in conversation with Sonali, and uh, I had done uh, I had done the interiors of this in 1990. This is of course the facade, which was designed by the architect was was Charles Courier, who I knew extremely well. Uh, but the facade was designed by another great friend called Howard Hodgkin. And this is the shadow of a giant banyan tree. So one had done the interiors. And I'm happy to note that after 25 years, uh, British Council and the British government decided that it needed a change. And they went to morphogenesis. So I think this is how it goes from one generation to the next. Because Sonali is a generation younger than me. Not, I'm not a generation. <laughs> no, no, no. A quarter, because quarter Sonali, generation maybe. <laughs> yeah, so I was happy to, I said, you know, this is a joint project, so it was an opportunity to show it. Yeah. That's very kind. Thank you, Sunita. That was wonderful. In fact, one thing I'm going to do off the record is I'm going to ask you to try and organize a visit for Triple ID members through the Rashtrapati Bhavan sometime, whenever it's convenient here, if it's possible. 
um you're asking the wrong person right now i think i think you have many other people who who know the president who can you know who can get it done or who know secretary to yeah, the president it's always nice to I'm go there with the design ana no point going there with just walking in and seeing the place no i'm very happy to i'm very happy to do be the guide through i mean i know rashtrapati bhavan like literally like the palm of my hand because it's a highly highly research project i have looked at every single drawing in england that he made for the building oh wonderful. so so let's try and work out a visit there and we'll take take you along as the guide because sure sure sure, sure sure and now sure. sonali coming to that now you've seen whatever uh, sunita has done and i'm sure you're familiar with the work but i'm not all talk about the future and now with this covid pandemic that's happening and it's changing our whole everything what hmm. according to you is the way forward for us is it vernacular or is it technology because everyone is talking about technology now you know um architecture and design per se has always been the output of of humanity for humanity right so i think at all points uh, something that is derived out of its context or refers to its history is uh, a regionalist or vernacular or should be at least inspired by vernacular and technology is always a technology available at that time when the project is being conceived so to me the two are not separate entities they are two there are two parameters which operate in every paradigm and with a pandemic i think there are two things that i strongly feel about this pandemic i firstly this pandemonium of the corona has been created uh by by humans it has been created by uh, not respecting the boundaries of uh, that should be respected between nature and habitation between uh, species within habitation so uh, i think number one to think about the environment is even more critical this is an example i mean we can keep denying that there is no climate change and so on and so forth but uh, but this is there it, it's it's democratically affecting everyone so i think this is the time for a pa- not just a paradigm shift but a paradigm change and in that still vernacular or technology to me is not a question that is a given it is the parameters to think about now this particular project that you are showing is a off grid net zero facility we just finished finished for a luxury brand for forest essentials and this has no electricity no water taken from anywhere and it has zero waste that leaves the site okay and it uh, on a hill of load sea it supports 800 people that directly or indirectly that live on the entire hill and 64 people were used to build this building of which 60 came from this hill so and this is an example of off grid architecture and uh, so for me yes it is vernacular inspired yet it supports the community uh, so it's as relevant here or today as it would have been 50 years ago or will be 50 years later so this is more views so i mean every almost a large amount of ingredients that uh, go into the forest essential products come from uh, uh, the hill now this is okay now we are talking about technology so whilst the appearance of the previous one may be that it's more vernacularly inspired this is a project which actually the images are from four months before it actually finished um uh, this is zyrus corporate headquarters now this is actually inspired this is um, this is a doubly curving wall uh, which faces the west now it faces the west to be sustainable because it's one of the hottest parts of the country the climate uh, the temperatures go above 45 we know we must uh, put a blank face to the west side and which is exactly what has been done so this this building was inspired uh, from uh, from the kansaras so it's a doubly curving surface made out of metal which is what you see over there and uh, the mirror work which is these images because i guess they're during construction uh, if you see if when we see yeah when you see this these little dots that you see are actually mirrors and they are prismatic and they catch the sunlight as the sun moves across the facade so this comes from the bhungas of south gujarat and and the fact that people move in between walls i mean they tap the spine is in between walls comes from pavagarh fort which is many kilometers down the same road 
where where people move to be protected from in that case from the enemy but in this case from the western sun people move from uh, within the ramparts so there are many ways of understanding vernacular vernacular understands where the sun is where the wind is where what the resources are you know and that is as relevant to a building which is like this building which is completely uh, embedded with technology and of course for me uh, wherever i work uh, not daylight more than 90% of the building that's the target we set for ourselves uh, any any building we work with has to be more than 90% daylight and this building is 90% daylight and you could see in that last picture the doubly curved kind of forms inspired from the kansaras amazing especially that the work, what you've done on the western wall it's it's become a work of art in its, its in itself thank yes. you thank you and uh, sunita now i want to bring you back to the one controversial line that you mentioned and we we love controversy in triple id so we'll ask you that question uh, you've been the chairperson of spa bhopal so what are your views on oh sunita's gone oh. so video video shut off no no she's not Sunita, I can hear you now. Yes. Yes, yeah, Sunita. I was saying that I'm going to take you back to a controversial question, that a controversial statement that you mentioned in your initial opening remarks. Uh, since you're the chairperson of SPA Bhopal, you've been. You, I just wanted to ask, what is your views on the new notification that there is no formal degree in architecture required to practice architecture? Would you care to comment on that? Uh, I don't think that that should be there as a as a and i'm saying that in spite of the fact that i never studied design i studied literature i have a visharad in hindustani classical music uh and i became a designer by accident but i am seriously i'm a serious autodidact i seriously studied design uh i do not think that this is this i mean if my if any one of my various children were to ask me that can we also like you be a designer or an architect without studying design i would say absolutely not because i think there are technologies there are there is engineering there is so much that you study when you are doing a formal course of 5 years of course having been my experience of having been a chairperson of the school of planning and architecture i i'm proud to say that that there were there were several firsts that i brought in including a great emphasis on the study of the humanities because uh, and also the first vernacular uh, conference of of uh, southeast asia where 400 delegates participated and this was in collaboration or in partnership with the uh, manav sangrahalaya so there was that and out of which 190 delegates were vernacular architects and there is you know they have a knowledge which we can only aspire to learn and i think that more and more architectural schools should be teaching this unfortunately you know so many architectural schools have just mushroomed and mushroomed without maybe uh, what the spas offer which are national institutes of excellence but they but so what they are being taught because there's a lot of learning and education that can happen which is outside the studio outside your your classes and abroad i find uh, having been familiar with uh, several um, major institutions of design and architecture uh, abroad having lectured there or spoken there or you know one's own daughter having gone there is that it's not only that they study architecture or design but they also study uh, they can have other subjects like the management of architectural sites or the psychology of architecture i mean there are so many different disciplines within the larger discipline of architecture and of course as i mentioned before i uh, i am um, i never studied it but 
uh, but I feel ex- and I can't be blase about it. I'm extremely proud uh, that and honored that I was the first, a first uh, person to be bestowed the Padma Shri in this discipline of design and architectural restoration. So there was that, but I do not think that uh, this is the way forward. Lachins himself, who designed the 32, uh, the 32 miles, which comprise what is known as the Lachins Bangalow zone and New Delhi, he himself, for various reasons, uh, which because of ill health mainly, he could not even go to school, leave alone architectural school. And yet his contemporaries say that he knew some secrets of our of of our our tri- of our art that were not known to us and i think also it's very important that uh, people should recognize particularly young people that that is design and architecture for them because it's not something just to do i mean you have to have a passion for it you have to also have, um, it's also a hunar, like, like musicians are born and then you can hone that skill because there's so much else to do in design. So first must come the recognition of that is design and architecture for you. Otherwise, there are so many other avenues in design, if you're passionate about it, that are also open to young people. That's my view on it. Thanks a lot because we are we at Triple ID have this problem because many of us are not architects. I'm not. Yeah. If you're not an architect, to be an interior designer, there is no statutory body in this country. There, unlike the Council of Architecture, there isn't the Council of Design. Mm. So everyone and his uncle today is an interior designer and a fashion designer and a product designer and whatever else. <laughs> Well, actually, now, Hemant, having said that, given this current uh, notification that has come, uh, actually, then that's no problem at all. But, um, I mean, I, I agree with Sarita Ji on so many of the things that she said about uh, people who train themselves. I mean, there are many other architects, Ando for one, who was a boxer and then became an architect. So, because it is a profession so close to humanity, okay, it, it's not a surprise that there are many legends that are self-trained, okay? But that could, that is, in my opinion, true for any profession that serves humanity. For example, you can, a doctor can be self-trained, okay? There are enough Hakims who would be self-trained and, you know, before their MBBS degrees and all that came. And uh, there are enough lawyers who can, who can study, I mean, who don't have to be lawyers per se, but can study when people fight for their own rights, they can study and know what is required in more depth than anyone that who represents them. So, so there are so many professions. There are singers, dancers who are self-trained. And, and uh, they're better than people who've been to years and years of um, schooling and education. But I think what an architectural education, for example, gave me, uh, besides the title of an architect, because I studied in two universities with a very different pedagogy. So I went to School of Planning and Architecture, Delhi, and then I went to the Architectural Association, London. And I went to what a lot of people say, I happened to be at the Architectural Association at the sort of the golden days of the day. And uh, where, where the current names, Rempula, Zahadi, they were, they were Ben Van Berkel, they were all, all professors over there at that time. And uh, John Fraser and uh, Baram Shida, like all the, the so-called star architects, which is the term I suppose that is used nowadays for them, were all professors around me at that time. And, uh, the two, what it gives you is a meta language. It gives you a ability to process things in a certain way. It allows you to choose the analytical paths that works for you. Okay. It allows you, it allows you a common language. Okay. And I think the discourse and debate is one of the key things that takes design forward. Okay. Now it allows you much like when you're born and you learn the language of the community and the family around you so that you can communicate with them. At the least, what an education does, at the least, gives you a shortcut to that language. Okay, so the meta language of a university and the pedagogy of the university, I think are tools to sharpen your mind for design thinking. I don't think a university ever teaches you a final product, in my opinion, or at least least a good university. 
should not be teaching you the final product. Nobody can teach that. Okay, but it's, it's, um, it's a template. They put a template for analytical thinking. Um, if you are of a research orientation, then, then that, so it's just a template that it provides you. And it provides you with peers and mentors. You know, of course, there's nothing to say that you can't find them in the world without the university. Of course you can. But it provides you with that whole environment. It provides you with, like, I've communicated. I, I got my love of structural engineering from actually being at the A. Because I met a structural engineer who inspired me a lot. And actually, I thought was talking more design thinking than a lot of architects I knew. Were. And to date, I have a love of structural engineering. And I work really hard to understand each and every aspect of it that is really um, relevant to my projects. So um, as much as I am a proponent of that a lot can be done, which is self-driven, because even if you can have the best education in the world, if the drive and motivation to learn is not there, then design is not the profession for you. Because also, you learn the project. You learn I, the project. I agree with Sonali. Because, you know, she's taken both uh, points of view, which I think are important to know. And uh, for, say, for somebody like me, why am I so research oriented? It's because I did a PhD uh, in English literature on Christopher Marlowe, which is, which I did not complete. But that taught me how to research. Yeah. And of course, the other ways that you uh, that you uh, build up your visual vocabulary is by studying, by reading, and by traveling. And I was fortunate that I had parents who took us from a very early age. And that's what I've tried to do with my children and grandchildren and things. Because, you know, uh, I often told them, look, they would say that we are the only ones who haven't been to a Disney world. I said, sorry, I'm not taking you. You know, I'll take you to China. I'll take you to Bhutan. I'll take you to Egypt, but I'm not taking you to Disney world. Of course, it's another story. I ended up when I read going to the one in Europe and realized, my God, look at the input of design that has gone into creating this, uh, this, uh, this theme park. Any case. So I think that, that uh, I, I really think just to finish this, I think that is very important to study design and architecture or both or, you know, have us in England, you can, in America, you can also do a second degree. Uh, you know, you can do things like photography with it. You can do things like carpentry with it. But I think it's very important to have that, but also to realize within oneself that is this what I can be passionate about for the rest of my life. I think that is the key. Thanks, because we, we, as I told you, Triple ID is stuck with this, and it's, it's become the Supreme Court judgment has been controversial. A lot of, lot of uh, objections to that. A lot of things. Even I believe even an appeal is being thought of. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's see what the audience goes. Uh, we have a little poll. I wish you if you can run the poll, please, and see what the audience thinks whether it is a good decision or not. That's poll number three. Go. Degree in architecture, absolutely. So, Nali and Sunita, you can vote if you like. Uh, I vote for disagree. Architecture degree is a must. How do I vote? I don't know. But, yeah. Okay. Well, 84% seem to agree with you. So, no, because when one has the ability, to be educated in a particular discipline, one must do it. I mean, everybody is not, it doesn't happen by chance that, uh, that, uh, that, you well, know, say, exception, exceptions cannot define the rule. If the yes. rule, exceptions cannot define the rule. I agree. Are exceptions. So the final results yes. are out. It's 82% who agree that the architectural degree is a must. Yes. So it's always nice to know what our audience is thinking because they're listening to you live and they yes. can always make up their mind or change their mind. And uh, Vishu, while we're at it, we had a very good discussion on vernacular and technology. Can you run that poll also, please? And just see what the audience thinks about that. Let the audience quickly in 30 seconds give us a poll on this. This is a, this is a you know, you can't be one or the other. 
That's it. That's I it. agree. It has to be. You can't vote like this because it has to be technology and the vernacular. I mean, you can't have either or. That's not how simplistic life or architecture or design is. Unfortunately, polls are simplistic. I mean, if we had multiple choice, people would take both. So we end up nowhere. <laughs> okay. So let, let's see what people feel. We're still technology is 61 percent. So I think it's the COVID that has probably swung the balance. That's it. In fact, even our meeting today, instead of meeting on a panel discussion in India Habitat Center, we're meeting on a Zoom webinar. So that's technology for you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, Sonali, I'd like you to take the, you to take a question now. If you, I wanted to ask you, what do you see the larger role and responsibility of an architect designer in a post-pandemic world? So I think, in my opinion, um, I will, there are so many different issues to address, but I first want to address the most uh, painful one, which is that of the situation of the migrants. Okay. I feel that uh, in India, with the large nation that we are, uh, there was one huge oversight in all our planning policy so far, which is our Indianness, our family values, our culture. Now, in all our large city, 50% or 40% of the population, like in Delhi, 40% of the population is migrant. In Mumbai, it's more than 50%. Okay, these people are people who are a site labor, they, they are various kinds of handymen, restaurant service, blah, blah, the list is endless. They live this two days, three days away from their homes, uh, travel distance. They go home once a year. So there are those many young people growing up in this nation without mostly a father figure present or, or visible once a year. So we did not think how this nation has to grow. Being the youngest nation in the world, we have created a planning situation whereby a project is conceived. Nation building is not conceived. You know, there needs to be a master plan for nation building. Why do people have to travel two days to get work? Why does somebody from Bihar go to Bangalore to work? Why are the, there has to be a decentralized urban plan, urbanization plan for the youngest nation of the country, whereby this mass migration and, and growth of families without their, one of their parents available to them is, is something that absolutely should not be happening. They need to be like 500 mini cities where people migrate to where they can go back home on weekends where they can meet their families and the growth map has to has to be like that it doesn't have to be that all the money is centered in mumbai and therefore all the people migrate to mumbai so so as urban designers there has to be a uh, and, and right now there's a very large gap between policies that are designed within the government and urban designers that work outside the government. Okay, there is there is no meeting, there is no synergy. So it nation the act of nation building cannot be like that. So I think the what the pandemic has has brought um, brought home to me is that we need to design the growth of this nation differently. It's not going to come by just saying put a sanitizer and UV light at your entrance. That's that cannot be the only learning it cannot be that you live only that you sit 1.8 meters away from the next person in your office those are kind of immediate knee-jerk kind of reactions for your own safety but you're not safe as a nation if 40 50 percent of the nation has to be running around in trays and buses and scrambling every time there is a crisis but sonari what is the role of a designer in this I and mean, what is we as a designer it uh, is what can we do about it? It is absolutely the role of an urban designer and a town planner. And, and this policy of how a nation grows needs to be spearheaded by architects and urban designers and only implemented by the government administrators. Right now, it happens in reverse. Yes, I, I agree with you on that. One, definitely. I mean, right now, you look at a central Vista project. It is being it is being conceived by an administrator and designed by an architect. And urban. it needs to be if if it was required in this city, it needed to be conceived by an urban designer and an architect, and then 
the administrator would have played a role in getting it executed. Central Vista is something I'm definitely not going to get Sunita started on because then we are going to no, it's a, Don't get me started. I, I don't know why I brought it up. I can speak for five hours on the issue. I know. I know. I Both know. of you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's, uh, but I'm glad that uh, Sonali mentioned it because, and in conjunction with COVID-19, well, separately on its own, I think the redevelopment of the Central Vista has not gone through, um, has not been conceived, uh, is ill-conceived, to put it very boldly, because I think we needed to have a much larger uh, much larger deliberations, which involved the many of from the from the uh, community of urban planners and of architects, and uh, I mean all these shortcuts that seem to have been taken arbitrarily and very quickly should not have happened. After all, let us see what is New Delhi. New Delhi was going to become a world heritage city till a couple of months before it was just removed. And it is, and why should that have happened? We don't know. For this project. But the fact to, huh? For Sorry. this project. Well, because they must have, you know, in their wisdom known that this project is going to be coming about. So they didn't want to have it as a world, give it the status of a world heritage city. But it is the few cities in the world which have been planned as a garden city. I mean, it's quite unique in its own way. And then, you cannot fault what Lachins did say in Rashtrapati Bhavan or Baker did in uh, in uh, in North and South Block because and at the, the end and, and, and the Parliament Park. Building and Sir Roberto Russell did you know did most of the bungalows that are there plus North uh, Western Court Eastern Court so they were they were actually deeply influenced by what they saw in India whatever remarks they might have made earlier. But the fact of the matter is when you have major architectural um, historians calling it a double magnificence because it took the best of the East and the best of the West. And so, so in a way, if you look at Rashtrapati Bhavan with its Sanji dome, its chajas, its chhatris, its motifs, uh, whether it's the snake, whether it is the, which are the elephants, it's a different matter that Lachians did not acknowledge that he took the elephant straight from the Lahori Gate at the Red Fort, which is a Mughal building. But, but maybe that was a colonial mindset where you could acknowledge what you took from the Vatican, which is like in, in India Gate, you know, the, 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 uh, the huge uh, cons that are placed there. He took that from the Vatican, which he acknowledged that he had taken from there. But what I think is that the greatest crime that is being done to the heritage of a city is when a city has been planned with public spaces and then you remove 86 or 87 acres from the use of the common person and put it within, within uh, you again build a wall around it uh, for uh, the use of government. So I think... Firstly, I think as a concept, uh, as a the, that to have conceived doing this in the manner that it leaves much, uh, much to be said, and I leave it to the judgment of uh, you know the morality and the ethics of the architects involved, whether they should have been involved in this or not, or whether they should have better advised the government that this is this should not be done. Secondly. India is facing the largest humanitarian tragedy in the world. Yes, we have controlled COVID-19, but we have the largest humanitarian tragedy in the world. Yes. And at a time like this, you're taking out these monies of starting with 20,000 crores and you're just putting it into a project which is not necessary. Yes, you can later on think of you want to bring down Shastri Bhavan or, you know, some of the Bhavans that came up in the 1950s, which the world over were not the best, uh, best uh, part of architectural history because it was post the Second World War. So why not have these huge, uh, you know, debates with 
everybody put it out into the public domain that this is what we want to do we invite urban planners we invite yes, architects absolutely. you can't leave it to the vision of of one person his might have been the most sober maybe out of i of those horrific plans that were presented they're all in the public domain but who is one person or, or in fact who is one government to to mess around with what so, is our heritage so i'd like to also to add i'd like to add to what you're saying is that you know it's not every day that a great nation builds its capital okay yes. so firstly i mean i'm going to leave aside the wisdom that whether we need this new capital to be built so i'll i'll leave aside that for a moment i i believe that you know like one of the reasons that i returned from england to india was that i found that Uh, in the 80s 90s somehow indian while great architecture was going on in india in indian voices were not heard globally and uh, you know with, with the exception of maybe late sri charles korea maybe a little bit uh, shri doshi there was there was not much of a debate or discourse going on and and i wanted to come back to india and look at this newly opened economy where we could be part of a global discourse and exchange of ideas design and conversation then i find that today we are building a nation a, a capital of this great nation and and the world is going to look towards india okay and what are we doing instead of following any stakeholder involvement any processes that that require for input we are going to act do one so called competition present the world with one idea and and it's it's kind of starting you know the reverse reverse uh, like a date gets decided and in reverse at a crazy kind of speed a project gets put together that's is that how one builds a nation is that how we want the whole world to be looking at us here we are debating vernacular technology urban context history but but people and architecture and design are a community collaborative profession as we all know i mean we can't build one building without requiring an architect engineer landscape architect absolutely maker so now even bank finance also plays a role in it market studies x y z endless traffic sustainability now these things right you may do a competition but at the end all this team should come together and in and inspire the project but mm. but in the kind of time frame 2 years people can't build a little house in 2 years you know how are these processes of stakeholder involvement so i'm so my biggest grouse is there are no they are as things when you do something and just present it to somebody then you're presenting it you're not taking input so no you're not and also you know sonali this is not the first time things like this have happened i mean i go back many years somebody like me because i was working on the sort of projects which are on raisina hill so one knew the paths that were you know um, because i was presenting directly to the president or directly to a prime minister whatever it was it took me 15 to 17 years with of course a lot of help from other people to have rashtrapati bhavan and this complex declared national heritage buildings because bureaucrats were not willing to do it because they felt they would lose some sort of control over it and it took that long to have it because they were not more than 100 years old so you know we have to change so many things and sometimes you know the political bosses don't even know what is happening down below and those are the sort of people that people like you and i and any project where government is involved uh, need to uh, will always work on us so these are not private things that we have done of course though I, you know you know in many places in the world if you want to talk about best practices actually any any major building leave alone public buildings uh, the plans are put up in public domain for a long period of time you know <laughs> all public interest is uh, heard hmm okay so i just wish that if 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 this was to be done there would be a larger stakeholder involvement more intellectual uh, bandwidth within uh, uh, provided to the project with the kind of experts available to us in this country and uh, and right now of course uh, 
I don't, I don't see how even one person would think mm. that this is the right uh, direction for us to move post-pandemic. I think so, because I think there is something almost, I hate to use the word, almost immoral and unethical to even think that which you've spoken about this great tragedy, we're all aware of it. You know, we are privileged. You and I are ed educated. We are living in our own homes. But there is such a huge human tragedy which is occurring. And to think of pushing forward projects like this, I think there's something not right in our way of thinking. And uh, I just hope that better sense will prevail. And to that, I also want to add that, you know, this whole thing that I see of getting architects from abroad to like, uh, I don't know whether there'll be time to uh, show the last few slides, but there's a house uh, that I've done, a very contemporary house because I have a contemporary mindset, though I've been working for 50 years. It's a very contemporary house. They got an architect from Singapore to do it. And I just thought, and I did the interiors. Actually, the house is known for its interiors. If there was ever time, you would see it. Uh, but I'd love to see it Hemant, if it could be shown. Yeah, we can run the slides. Rishu, can you run the okay. slides? Uh, but so, anyway, because we but, were going to ask Sunita about her craft, which is something that she specializes in. So, Sunita, uh, please well, carry on and we'll run the slides simultaneously. Okay, this is uh, Bhuvaneshwar, a hotel I did very early on for the Oberoi's, and where it used the great, great craft skills of, of, uh, of stone carving. And in fact, the person who I discovered then, I found him, he only had two people working for him, Raghunath Mahapatra. Now he's got a Padma Vibhushan in 2015. The only master craftsman in India to have got a Padma Vibhushan. So I'm glad I found him. This is, uh, you know, uh, the, the building in the parliament building in Bhutan, where again, again I used several uh, crafts that belong only to Bhutan and which are particular to Bhutan and somehow incorporated them into whatever one was, you know, whether it was the National Assembly Hall or the entrances. We can move on to the next slides so that we do it quick. And, you know, <clears throat> making the, the Bhutanese flag carved in high relief in, um, in, um, in wood using their craft traditions, all the paintings of um, you know, I worked with several painters. I worked with several master craftsmen. This is the this is the assembly hall, and what you see are uh, the windows. These windows are always only used outside a Bhutanese building. So I was the first designer who brought them in as an architectural element because I needed to house the simultaneous translators. So and now that has become. I mean, this was the first of its type and now you see it often being used in Bhutan. And then, you know, the ceiling above where I worked with the national, uh, the, the, the Lama who was the director, because, you know, they are so precise in what their motifs are. And I wanted to put this, these paintings above so that because a mandala above signifies that it bestows blessings on those below. And this was a restoration of a 250-year-old fort I did for Mr. Oberoi. And here um, I used, I mean, it had nothing in it. I'm sorry, I happened to be in that picture. I couldn't find another one, which this is at Agra Fort. This is low-relief marble fountain, which I had absolutely and completely duplicated. And in this Naila Fort, why I showed it was, that earlier, wherever you saw Pietra Dura work in Agra, was all on you know tabletops and little little uh, uh, little little you know uh, chess boards and things like this. But inside, where there are three courtyards and a smaller one inside, there is the most exquisite Pietra Dura work. So I brought back that work, which was used architecturally only the way it should be used and not for little decorative boxes and, you know, chess boards and things like this. I think uh, we can, so this is just, I couldn't find very many pictures so quickly. So this is just one of the pictures it's showing a little Pietra Dura. And uh, if we go, and this, uh, this is a perspective, but I, as I said, I couldn't find the photograph, but the reason why I showed it is this is Ella Rish, which is, on the north coast of the 
of the Mediterranean, very close to Jerusalem. And here I saw what it was that Egypt does. They have a tradition of making baladi glass from the 8th century. So I, I used those craftsmen and I got the trunks of these uh, and uh, El Arish is full of date palms. And I used an actual date palm as a dye for these. They're huge, these huge date palm trees that were done. So I like to work with the crafts that belong uh, to a particular place. So it makes it culturally specific. This is a contemporary house one had done in 2004, 2005. And uh, this is this is the one designed by uh, Sonali. This is the one designed by uh, by the Singaporean architect. I mean, there's nothing wrong with him. But why did they require somebody to come from Singapore? We have such great architects here. They could have done the same thing. Of course, I added all the, if you go back, I added all the line of, of of granite temples which I had which are taken from an actual one which is a tank temple and all the bronze uh, lotus leaves are again done by Radha Krishnan another great bronze maker so one uses in a very in a very uh, contemporary context I personally like to use a ground it in an Indian context this is the inside, which, uh, which I mean, there's a great collection of art in this house. Furniture is, of course, all handmade from my own uh, workshops. Uh, there, Yes, there are things that were imported from Italy for it. But the ceilings, if you notice, it's an old technique of doing, uh, of doing, uh, you know, of chahawing work uh, on uh, gold and silver work. And to, to kind of... This became a visual form of our great Ganga Jamini Tehzeeb. And whether somebody got it or not, I wanted to have this, which was one of our great secular traditions. Wonderful. Amazing. The work is absolutely amazing, Sunita. No Thank wonder. 50 Thank years you. Of, of a body of work that is outstanding, absolutely. Thank and you. And Sunani, now to Thank close, you. the last question to you. I wanted to ask you about, since you do a lot of urban design also and master planning and things like that, will that how do, after the COVID, because COVID is very important, it's something that's dominating our thought process right now. So thanks to COVID, what change do you see in the way we design generally? We plan our cities and experience our built environment. So, um, you know, during the COVID time, when, uh, I started to rethink about what would I have done differently in some of my work. And some seem to have some natural uh, things that were working, would work even better in COVID times where people needed a certain amount of uh, social segregation. Though I have to admit, I mean, throughout our entire, my entire career so far, it has been about social amalgamation. And now I have to suddenly start thinking about segregation. Having said that, uh, this particular project uh, uh, that you see Grand Carmen in Bangalore, it could be it could be one of many other types of housing uh, communities. It's essentially all IT young families. But in this particular project, it was a, because there were a lot of children and the age group was very young. We completely pedestrianized. Uh, it's 100 percent pedestrian complex of houses and uh, over 500 houses, I think. And we completely did great separation where every outsider arrives at a very ventilated, very daylit basement level, which is this. Okay, and every house has an entry from the basement and every outsider to the project has to come from the basement. And then only if a house owner lets them up through the house, do they actually ever access the ground. So, that time it was done for children safely, which could roam freely in the entire complex where both parents were doing 10 hour shifts in some, you know, Wipro or Infosys or something. Today, I find that this is an absolutely phenomenal way for a, com for a community to uh, uh, safeguard itself in the current situation. So that's why I put this is a very old project of mine, but that's why I, I put these slides here. Another project that came to mind was um, uh, Surat Diamond Bores. Uh, sorry, uh, these are just more clubhouses, images of the of the same project. It was a very low cost young family homes, uh, which uh, which were de designed for 
more, a lot for children and community living actually. Uh, this is the project Surat Diamond Bowl which came to mind because this was a global competition that we won. And this is the world's largest single building. Uh, for those of you who don't know, currently it's the Pentagon. This is due to finish in 15 months and this, then this will be the world's largest building. Now, this is the pride of the diamond merchants of uh, actually Saurashtra starting from Surat all the way to Mumbai. And uh, what you see an image here, this is uh, radiant cooling. So radiant cooling, which is typically a cooling underflow cooling technique used uh, in many places in the world. We've actually cooled all the non-air conditioned corridors. So uh, all of us know these typical Indian buildings, schools, colleges, especially where corridors are not uh, air conditioned. Now we have radiant cooling in the corridors and 50% of this area, which is larger than most airports, uh, is actually not air conditioned, but conditioned, microclimate conditioned through this radiant cooling insulation. And, and this building is 70 lakh square feet single building. Uh, greenery and green lungs are through the project. So today we are telling people that meet outside, keep your windows open, get ventilated. Actually, 100% of the circulation area of this project is non-air conditioned and totally ventilated. There are a lot of vertical uh, air shafts created where, because hot air, as we know, rises. So, so there is a horizontal and vertical air movement. The entire circulation, as you can see in this the early sketch when the project, this is a sketch from the competition actually. And, and a lot of the corridor breaks out into gardens. And, and so, and this is the project, uh, this image is from about a year ago, uh, project under construction. Uh, it's, whilst it's a lot of buildings because there was a lot, this diamond trading community, almost 95% of all diamonds in the world, uh, entirely or in part, will go through this building once the building is finished. Okay, so there's a lot of office space, but if you notice, it's all designed around courtyards because it's because there's a lot of, uh, in this particular community um, deals a lot with like, you know, little portly of diamonds here, then meet in the courtyard, eat, eat a meal, uh, exchange, uh, do some trading. And uh, so there's a lot of outdoor living, which I feel, I feel now that as an office complex, this amount of outdoor living is going to be a success in the COVID times. The other reason when we, uh, which we emphasized on during the competition, which later the client told us was one of the reasons for winning, was we said that if these many people are going to enter this complex, this is 70 lakh square feet. And if you calculate it at even one person per 100 square feet, look at the number of people. Now, these many people have to enter and reach their office space in under seven minutes. Okay, so we worked on how to do it without overcrowding. Okay, and how the uh, entire movement is in one direction so that you don't have these thousands of people running across like this at the time they have to go to different offices. Today, that is a, somehow that is a recommendation that you move only in one direction. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that, is, that is so, so <laughs> outdoor living, out, outdoor working. And um, this uh, moving in one direction, uh, thinking like people think about movement of people only in airports, you know, that these are the number of people, you do the statistics, you figure the demographics when you design an airport, but people don't do it in large buildings. Mm -hmm. But actually large buildings are not that different. So we did a large amount of understanding of the culture of the people who use it and the demographics and the amount of time they, they, that should be spent without overcrowding and not no cross traffic. So somehow the building seems to be uh, already designed for uh, this kind of uh, what, what, is, what is advocated today. So It's very impressive. Thank it's you. very impressive. I really Mali, look forward seems to Many years ago you were designing for COVID. I, it wasn't COVID. <laughs> it was people. We were designing for how people should move. You know, when you have a large number of people, if they move in every direction, it creates chaos. Right. I mean, as, as some of the people on this talk have probably been involved in the interior design of an airport at some point. I mean, at airport, you think about that you just always move in the same direction. You don't go backwards and forwards. Okay. I don't know why people don't think about the direction you must move in when there are a lot of people. But that's what we thought about when this project was being made. But you know, uh, Sonali, if I might interject, it's not only in large buildings, 
that perambulatory paths must be preconceived in the mind of the designer or the architect. Yeah. Because even in a large home, you have to know within, say, a 30, 40,000 square foot home. Unfortunately, people do build or uh, fortunately build uh, homes of that scale. You have to know how the movement is taking place. Where, the people, might, are. Yeah. where people are. So wherever people are, you must design their perambulatory paths yeah. and see where everybody is going. So I think, you know, micro scale, macro scale, so many, there are so many defined type of, uh, what should I say, that, uh, that, you know, the parameters are the same. I mean, the extent might differ, but I think your building is fabulous. And I think it's really going to, it's already set itself. I hope it will become a huge role model because as you know, in India, what we really lack in architecture here, and I think that is changing rapidly, is architects like you and few others who are going to change the respect that Indian architects have today for themselves. Otherwise, everybody has been going and trying to cog something from the West. That is not the way. I mean, you see all the big buildings that have come up, Gurgaon for one. You know, everything is a copy of something. Nobody's trying to think from within that what it is. Maybe clients, uh, you know, show them things and they say that this is what we want. And yes, um, there must be some architects who agree to it because otherwise they feel that they will lose the commission. But you know, uh, in the architects of your generation, a slightly younger generation, I think it's going to change the architectural face of India. Because, you know, so far, what if you look at our hill stations, I mean, we only know how to create slums because there is no urban planning, there are no rules, nothing is to be adhered to. Uh, all this must change. Where should it change from? I think, you know, people's voices uh, with the government. Without government, you can't do anything. I mean, that's for sure. So uh, all this has to come together in the best possible way because... You know, our time is finite. Mine, I speak for myself. My time is finite. But what is it that you're going to leave behind? I like think, yeah, that is what we must think of. Are we going to leave urban, the urban landscape a better place to live in or uh, stalemated or having become worse? And I think these are questions we all need to ask ourselves. Thank you so much. It's, I mean, it's been amazing. We are still a little bit of time left. Taking a couple of audience questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Sure. We have a lot of them. In fact, one of the major comments that we are getting from multiple people is that can we have one more session with Sunita ma'am and Sunani ma'am because one hour is not enough for us. So we shall keep that in mind and try to catch you once again. But one important question that's come out from a lot of the questions that we've received is uh, this is for both of you? How should the design fraternity, and especially you two, how are you rethinking sustainability and architecture for the new normal? So, Nali, you go ahead with this. You just spoken about it. You just continue with yeah, it. So just uh, carry on from what you were speaking. Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I, I rather we at Morphogenesis have a philosophy which we have worked on and which we have evolved. And, and uh, the acronym we have for it is SOUL, S-O-U-L. That every project has to be looked at for sustainability, has to be optimized for the result it wants to achieve, has to be unique because it has to be derived out of its past, present and future aspiration. And every location has its history, has its vernacular, has its people, has its arts and crafts, has its aspiration of the modern Indian and finally it must be livable finally it must be livable and and what do we define as livable and and obviously in the post pandemic there are a couple of more factors that have got added to livable okay so so for me that criteria doesn't change which is which is at the foundation of of every work that I do so yes 
but what it's not it's not a static principle it's not that one sustainability is the same for every building it's not that one unique is the same for every unique so i don't believe in an architect signature style i believe in a inquiry from first principles based on the fundamentals of sustainability optimization unique and livable and then the end result is a collaborative process of design thinking with with the group of designers engineers architects landscape architects that work upon it and and so therefore in some ways i haven't had to re reorient my mind just the parameters that influence uh, soul for me will get some will get deleted some will get added i think that's a wonderful acronym and uh, i fully endorse what you're saying because even for somebody like me i mean if the question was addressed i wouldn't do things differently because you've always taken care to bring in what is sustainable into it whether it is it is how do you bring in fresh air you don't need air purifiers to be running the whole day in a very large uh, in a very large home even you know uh, there is so much that we, but there is so much i think that we will add on to uh how we do it because i think the inside outside spaces will increase you have already put them in i uh, i often you know because we design small spaces large spaces and an F- far is small you know balconies are being brought in etc i don't think that's the way to go ahead and the this uh, this uh, covid 19 and the pandemic has taught us that the outside has an equally important part to play as much as the inside actually the greatest designer is nature so to be able to look out at that i think that's a great uh, and that's a great privilege well thank you very much it's uh, we're getting even more requests <laughs> for this is an injustice that one hour is not enough for two legends So they want well, one hour per legend. So we probably thank you, have thank you, s- <laughs> thank so you, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Sonali and Sunita. Thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you people are busy now that lockdowns are opening and your offices are restarting and everyone's trying to get their acts together once again. Thank you for taking time out. And actually, that requires rethinking how we are going to run our studios. how we are going to run our workshops you know since i manufactured that is going to require major rethinking so maybe, it's maybe not we'll have another webinar on that one <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you sonali it was wonderful speaking with no, you it's an honor to speak no, no, no no my my privilege absolutely thank and it's wonderful i love chatting for with coming you. on this webinar and supporting triple id in fact both of you have been very kind whenever we asked you for almost anything it's always been Thank very you. Positive step from your side. Thank you. Thank you, thank uh, you Heman, Sunita, for organizing you, this. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity to chat with you, chat with Sonali. So goodbye. I guess always a pleasure. And I'll just now do my formal vote of thanks because I have my other six chapters to thank. So thank you to yes. Goa, Jaipur, Mumbai, Chandigarh, Bangalore, and Coimbatore chapters for supporting us. Thank you for bringing. um attendees in great numbers and to the audience i would like to say please send us your questions please send us topics that you would like to see in future 